Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Dave Crouch. This is Policy Talks brought to you each month by Williamson, Inc., our Williamson County Chamber of Commerce. And it's good to uh, be here at Columbia State this morning, beautiful day. And we've got a bright-eyed audience here live in the uh, community room at uh, Columbia State this morning. Glad to have you all with us. We've got a live audience on uh, Channel 3 Cable TV with uh, WCTV. We've got, uh, goodness, I'm wandering this morning. Uh, WAKM AM 95 uh, should be live as well. So glad to have all of you with us this morning. We have got, I think, one of the, uh, I better not say this, I'll make somebody else mad, but we've got a great panel here this morning. And uh, we've got, I think, the two of the, the two men in Tennessee that know more about building roads than anybody else. And we've got two other guys that know more about financing them and, and paying for them. And so uh, looking forward to our discussion this morning, our uh, honored guest this morning is Paul Diggs. Paul is uh, recently retired from TDOT. He was with TDOT for 35 years, most uh, recently as a senior policy advisor as they were shepherding the governor's transportation bill through the legislature. He spent uh, 18 years as the chief engineer at TDOT. And uh, so uh, from what I hear, he is an encyclopedia of knowledge about uh, Tennessee roads. Looking forward to picking his brain. Beside him is uh, uh, Kent Starwalt. Kent is the executive vice president at the Tennessee Road Builders Association. And he is he and his friends built all the roads in Tennessee. And uh, Kent has been a, a, a t attending these off and on for years, and uh, we always enjoy having his input. He, uh, Kent, how long have you been with uh, Tennessee Road Builders? Just, get, just getting started good. 27 years. So, and spent eight years in Washington with the American, uh, basically, Road Builders Association there. But you came from Illinois. Now, a lot of other people have come from Illinois since then. Uh, yes, sir. I, I tell people I, I left Illinois before it was fashionable to do so. so yeah, so. I left Illinois 20, uh, 35 years ago and did it before it was fashionable to do so. That's great. That's good. To his left is uh, Sam Whitson. Sam is our state representative here in the 65th District in Franklin. He is the chairman of the Transportation Subcommittee in the House. And uh, so he was uh, sh very responsible for uh, helping get the governor's transportation through the committee system there. And uh, beside him is my neighbor, Jack Johnson, our uh, senator from Williamson County and also our uh, Senate uh, Majority Leader. And as Senate Majority Leader, Jack gets to sponsor and shepherd all the governor's bills through the, through the Senate. So... Uh, uh, all these gentlemen are very familiar with the governor's transportation bill, and we'll start off uh, kind of hitting the, the elements of that bill on a high note. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, Paul, I'll direct this one to you, but it looks like it's got three major parts, as I understand it. Um, it establishes a, a transportation fund, modernization fund, which I think that's new. That's, that's correct. Uh, it authorizes uh, design, build, or construction management contracts instead of the old-fashioned low-bid type contracts. It also uh, authorizes what are now known as choice lanes, uh, but uh, user fee facilities, I think the bill calls them, which uh, uh, to the uh, general public might be called a toll road. But uh, we'll talk about that in just a minute. $3.3 billion of new money uh, coming from the general fund. Now, has that ever been done before, Paul? Well, you know, n nothing to, to this magnitude. And I think if you look back, I think Governor Lee, uh, the, the transportation industry is a big fan, if you will. So last year, over $600 million was put in the transportation fund as a general fund transfer. Uh, this year, $3.3 .3 billion. <coughs> Uh, and there have been other transfers under the Lee administration uh, supporting um, our shoreline rail program and aeronautics programs as well. So, uh, but, but it is really unprecedented the number of dollars 
that uh, Governor Lee and Commissioner Ely have uh, championed putting into transportation? Well, uh, most people would say that's been needed and uh, uh, are clapping their hands and explain how that's being divided and how it will be allocated. So the, um, there was a lot of discussion in the department on how do we divvy up the, the 3.3 billion. So $300 million of that is going into what's called the state aid road program. The department has a program that funnels funds to all 95 counties via formula and state law. And so the $300 million is about 15 times the annual distribution that's going to, to the county. So the county highway agencies, uh, the, the, what I call the, 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 the roads that go from the, the rural areas to the state highways across the state, $300 million. The $300 million remaining is going to be divided uh, four ways. So, the, so TDOT is administri administratively broken up into four what we call regions. Uh, you know, headquartered in Knoxville, Chattanooga, Nashville, and Jackson, Tennessee. And so it'll be $750 million in each of those four regions. And one of the things that uh, the department had to think about was, well, do, how do you divide those dollars up? And one of the things that's being looked at is how do we leverage these dollars against private sector funds? And so that's one of the, the opportunities that the department is going to be exploring over the next six months is how can we take that $750 million per region and leverage it against other dollars to, to make the pie even larger? Okay, the $300 million, do we know how much Williamson County is going to get of that? Yeah, so the, the $5 million that, that, that is the state aid figure, the the... And, and so if, if you try to, you know, everybody wants to know, well, how much money is my community get, my city, my county, my, my region? And, you know, if we try to do everything by formula, then we would never build the major transportation infrastructure that we need across the state. Think about, you know, I-65 going down into Alabama. When you get down to Ardmore, Tennessee, there's not a whole lot of population down there. You wouldn't be able to build things like that. East Tennessee, I-26 going up into North Carolina, projects like that would never get built. So you have to look it up at a larger perspective, look regionally and say, how do we put the money and make investments that have the, the most benefit? So from a state aid standpoint, that is a formula program. It's largely about resurfacing and paving roads, but for capital investments of capacity expansion, you really have to look more regionally and say, uh, how does a project support the region? And, and if you look at interstate widenings, you know, the interstates don't go through every county in the state, but they support the economy of every county in the state. Right. Sam, Jack, um, any color you would like to share as far as how to fix Williamson County or, or what we expect to see from Williamson County from this new? Well, of course, we have a tremendous need to like every part of the state. And working with Paul and his team over the years, um, you know, we get a perspective. It's just, it's, you know, the, the issues are bigger than just Williamson County, the transportation. We have a $26 billion backlog, and that grows each year in transportation projects across Tennessee. We have several working right now, of course, the 96 uh, widening on the east side of town. We got a new interchange uh, that the city of Spring Hill worked with TDOT and our congressional delegation, Senator Blackburn, last year to expedite a new interchange down on the Buckner Road. <clears throat> we finished the, of course, the much needed Mac Hatcher's uh, expansion on the west side, and that was kind of a, a fallout from the Improve Act. So, uh, Again, it, it gives us a perspective, and, and we know that our rural interstates are really the challenge in this state. Uh, and I mentioned before in here, I've been driving since 1970 when I was 16, and I'm still driving on the same two-lane uh, directional interstates. And you mentioned Ardmore. That interchange was built in 1957. It's the first interstate interchange in the state of Tennessee, and it's not changed since 1957. 
and road miles uh, is, remain stagnant while our population has grown up. So that's the challenge. And I, I just want to say as chairman of the Transportation Subcommittee, uh, Paul and his team are always there every meeting we have. Uh, we meet on Wednesdays uh, uh, when we're in session. And, and Kent Starwalt and his team is also a valuable asset when you uh, lobbyists are important in mm -hmm. that so that you learn what are the challenges. You just cannot all of a sudden give $300 million and inspect roads to start building next week. It's oh, no. just not. It <laughs> but anyway, I'll, uh, Jack, do you want to say something? Well, I, I just want to say how pleased I am to be here with, with Paul. I, uh, when I first got elected to the Senate in 2006, as I was out campaigning and knocking on doors, probably the number one issue I was hearing about was to get I-65 widened from 96 down to 840 because that had not been done at that time. And, and at that time, Spring Hill was, was in my Senate district, and the people in Spring Hill very much wanted I-65 widened, which was a massive project. Had to completely redo the uh, Goose Creek Bridge there. Um, and uh, so one of the first people I reached out to was, was, was Paul Deggs. And I very quickly learned that if you need to talk to anyone about roads and how roads are built and where roads go, and Paul is the go-to guy. So, uh, of course, he has taken very much deserved retirement. But, uh, Paul, as long as you're, I've got your cell phone number, I'm going to continue to call you. I hope, I hope that's okay. You may be retired, but you're not going to be. But, but Paul and Sam did a great job. And, and when you're thinking about roads, David, that's the way you have to think about it. It's not just about improving or widening a road in Williamson County. When you think about that the people of Williamson County, how many of them drive to Nashville every day? How many of them drive to Huntsville? How many of them have to drive to the airport? When you're talking about transportation, it is a regional issue. It's not just about a particular project in, in a particular community. So that's why we, we did uh, pass the legislation to divide the money by region, and then within those regions, the various stakeholders can get together. And another key thing that we've talked about here at Policy Talks before that I think is important is, uh, you know, our mayor, uh, both of our mayors are involved in the Middle Tennessee Mayor's Caucus. And that's a good example of where the mayors from greater Middle Tennessee, they get together and talk about things that impact their community and what is going on in another community. So um, that's why we divided the money that way. And I think it'll, it'll end up being well spent. Ken pointed out to me when we were talking earlier this week, uh, watch out, Ken. The uh, the only important road is the one between where I live and where I want to go. So uh, <laughs> the greatest road ever built was the northwest section of Mike Hatcher. Kent lives in West Haven, so uh, <laughs> you can understand his uh, his his thoughts about the northwest uh, Mac Hatcher. Now um, we're going to come back to that in a minute, though. And uh, the uh, authorization for design build uh, contracts and uh, construction management that's a little different. And how do the road builders feel about that? And how do you think that's going to work? So or explain what it. That sure, does. sure. There's um, some alternative delivery contracts called design build, uh, progressive design build, uh, and the construction manager general contractor GMs, CMGC, and um, they basically combine all elements of sort of bringing the design community and the contractors together, uh, or uh, in some in some sort of format. Um, to be able to expedite projects uh, to get through the design, <clears throat> excuse me, get to the design phase faster, and then obviously get through the construction faster because you're doing the design, <clears throat> excuse me, at the same time you're doing the, doing the, uh, start even start doing the construction or you're getting the right of way, uh, and so are moving utilities, and so all of those contracting methods were already authorized with the exception of progressive design build, and what we what we did in working with the department is made some some changes to them. Uh, increase the, the amount that the department can do each year. Um, there was there was basically like 10 design build projects you could do, and there was some dollar limitations on the CMDC projects, and what they did was combined all that and said they could do 28 a year um, where on, a, on an annual basis to get all those projects done or to be able to do that. So, you know, we, we, were, we were concerned when the legislation came out just to make sure that, that how those uh, innovative contracting things worked um, we're not uh, onerous to the to the contractors and, and how we deal with the department, how we deal with the design community and that kind of stuff. So we, we worked out a, a great compromise and we're supportive of the bill because of that. And so, um, you know, the, the, the big concern probably from the Tennessee road builders is that many of these projects are very, very large. 
Uh, some of our members are able to, to bid on them. Some will not be able to just because the potential size of them. Um, to date, all of the innovative contracting projects that have been done have been done by our members. Uh, uh, you know, we've had some, some big out-of-state guys come in, but they're members of the road builders and have done fantastic work uh, around, even around the, the, the county here. So, you know, we're, we'll continue to work with the department on those. Um, and as they, as more and more come out, as they announce how the project's going to be built later this year. And so we look forward to working with them. Paul, from TDOT's point of view, um, how, how does this help? So I think one of the things that you, you have to look at uh, in, in Tennessee is we, we have a very conservative nature here. Regardless of your politics, uh, debt is not viewed very positively on, on uh, public works. And so our Tennessee General Assembly, working with, with the governor, has always tried to find a way to use like one-time money to cover of large expenses. So most people might not realize this, but Tennessee has no debt on our transportation system. Yeah. And, and well, we, we have none. Uh, I'm coming back. Uh, you know, we, we have none. Uh, but so one of the things, but the growth, the phenomenal economic success Tennessee has, has brought with it a lot of challenges, a lot of congestion. Uh, in the past, the department could break projects down into, you know, manageable size components that we could deliver to contract. But with congestion, with the complexity of projects, I mean, this isn't my daddy's highway department anymore. Um, you know, when I first started with the department, the chief engineer at the time said, you know, we can't let any projects that cost more than $10 million. They're, that's too big. Last week, the department awarded a $184 million project, a single project. When projects start to get so big that you can't break them down any smaller, you've got to have a new tool to be able to deliver them. And we probably have a do dozen projects in Tennessee right now that are in excess of $200 million. Some of them are over $500 million. Give us an example. So, um, you know, uh, the Sharps Gap interchange in Knoxville. I know uh, I-75 at I-640 and I-275, it's just a big malfunction junction, if you will, and it's very hard to build. Here in Middle Tennessee, I-40 I from the Silliman's Evans Bridge going out toward the airport, that narrow section, it's four lanes in each direction, it is a tough location. We all know it. You can't build half of that uh, or a third of that at a time. It's going to have to be a single contract. And so when projects start getting that big, we've got to think about how do we pay for those. We also have to think about how we build them. And one of the things that Kent alluded to is, is working with the contractor on some of these contracts. If you design a project to a contractor's manpower, equipment, uh, and skills, you can reduce a lot of risk. The department on a typical job has to design a project where anybody can build it. But if you narrow down uh, the number of bidders on a job and work with them to say, hey, we're going to want to do this in an expedited fashion because our customers tell us, look, we love highway construction, but be done with it and get out of here. You know, get in, get out. Using these new types of expedited delivery tools gives us the ability to do that. Again, as I said, uh, back in the day, most of TDOT's construction projects were rural in nature. That 1986 Better Road Program that Governor Alexander put in place was a program about adding capacity mainly in rural areas of the state. Today, the the even the rural interstates are so congested with traffic, we've got to find a way to get in and get out in a hurry. Tell us about the uh, choice lanes. And um, just to summarize, it's where private investment can be, can come in, a private company can come in and build additional lanes on our existing roadways, as I understand it. Correct. So, so one of the things to think about, so there in, in Tennessee, and frankly in the country in general, there is no appetite 
to raise motor fuel taxes. That, that there's just no appetite for that. And so it puts the, the transportation agency in a difficult position. Our customers are saying, look, the congestion is killing the economy here. It's killing the quality of life. How do we address that? And so what, what the solution is found is how can we get the private sector to bring money to the table? And that's what choice lane, lanes allow us to do. It is not what you would call a traditional toll road where if you want to go to point A to point B, you have to pay a toll. What this allows is if you want to go to point A to point B, you can take the traditional route or we can build additional lanes and we will guarantee the throughput. We'll guarantee 50 miles an hour travel speed and you will have variable tolling to, to, to allow the department to manage that congestion. So it's a really good tool. Texas, Florida, the Virginias, um, uh, you know, North Carolina are using this tool. Uh, it's, it's, again, it allows the consumer the ability to make that choice. And if think about it, if you're, um, when, we, when we, you know, the governor and, and several of the lawmakers went out to Texas and, and toured some of their facilities, and what, what the data is showing is that the people that are using this are the, the, the small business owners that are saying, hey, I've got to go, you know, I've got a swimming pool service in business. And if I pay another $3 for this choice lane, I can make another service call a day. It's really value associated with it, and it, and it allows people to have a much more predictable commute or a, a, a predictable uh, trip that they take. Pass the mic back to Jack. Uh, Jack, we're, uh, um, as I understand it, I've, I've got a copy of the bill here. And uh, believe it or not, I'll read stuff like that. But uh, the um, it looks to me like it allows bonds to be sold to pay for these choice lanes. Uh, bonds to be so by the private sector, is that correct? Well, it, it'll be up to the private sector entities that we partner with, and I'm going to let Paul correct me if I'm wrong, as to how they raise their capital. Um, it, in other words, you've got a company out there, and let's say it's a, you know, it's a, just use a round number, it's a billion dollar project to add lanes to an interstate facility. <clears throat> it's up to them to go raise their capital with investors, and and they may issue bonds to do that, or they may have other ways that they that they raise money. But the companies that do this, and as Paul said, we I flew with the governor down to Texas, and we toured all around Dallas with their Tex dot, their Department of Transportation people, <clears throat> to look at how these work, and it becomes a simple return on investment model. And these companies are very sophisticated. They can come in and take a look at. I-24 from Murfreesboro to Nashville, and look at the current traffic count, look at the growth that's going on around there, and they know with a great deal of certainty what the, the traffic will be on that, what the utilization of this choice lane will be, what they'll be able to charge, and therefore, how, how long it will take and what type of return on investment they'll, they'll be able to get to their investors. So yes, there, there is language in there. Quite frankly, and this is a critical part of the bill that I think there was some uh, misinformation out there. The state is not on the hook for any of that capital that is raised. That is the part of the, the private sector entity. Now, we may put some money into the project as well. That might be part of the negotiation. If it's going to be a billion dollar project, they may come to us and say, we'll pay for 900 million of it. Y'all put in 100 million. And then they'll go raise the 900 million from investors and uh, build it. And then we give them a lease. But we own the facility. We own it. And we're not on the hook for any of that debt. That, so if for some reason, and it's very unlikely to happen, if for some reason they miscalculated and didn't do their numbers right and didn't get the appropriate rate, rate of return that they thought that they would, that's on them and their investors, not on, on the Tennessee taxpayers. Will, these, uh, will they be able to sell tax-free bonds to do that? I don't, I don't believe so, no, because it's a private sector entity. That's a good question, but I might... Some I'm, of these sports I'm, facilities and so forth issue tax-free bonds. But those are sports authorities, and those are quasi-governmental entities that are created by the state. That's not what this is with these choices. It's okay with me, because I sell some tax-free bonds. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure, consult your tax advisor. Do not take tax <laughs> advice from me, but I'm pretty sure that these bonds would be, the, the, the interest on these bonds would be taxable. 
because they're not being issued by a governmental entity. Paul, are we correct on that? Yes. Okay. The, uh, oh, and Dave, one more part of that too, people need to understand, we're not replacing existing roadways with these new uh, choice lanes. Uh, they will be new lanes constructed particularly, uh, just specifically for that purpose. The, um, do we have any idea of which projects might rank first uh, in the choice lane in, um, effort? So the short answer is no, but I, I mean, I think that it's somewhat intuitive if you look across the state. So what the the governor and the commissioner committed to to the General Assembly was that between passage of the legislation and December of this year, they're doing the number crunching. And so they they have looked at, you know, where do opportunities exist across the state, not only for choice lanes, but for capacity expansion on the interstates. One of the, the big pushes that the governor talked about and the commissioner talked about was uh, widening rural interstates. So the, that analysis work is being done right now. Um, and if you think about it, doing all of that uh, brain damage, if you will, uh, as, as the commissioner likes to say, uh, before the legislation was passed, probably wasn't appropriate. If, if, if there wasn't going to be a chance that this could pass, then spending the money to do all that analysis didn't make sense. So between May and December of this year, and that, that work is underway as we speak right now, they're looking at all the corridors across the state that, that make sense. I mean, obviously, the I-24 corridor uh, makes sense, but certainly there are sections of I-65 uh, north and south that have uh, that have potential opportunity as well, and you know, in I forty, I mean, really, if you look at all the interstates, there's there's opportunities out there. Uh, this this is Jay Norris. Jay, tell us what you do. So, I am the good morning, everybody. I'm the assistant chief engineer and regional director for Region Three, which is the the 26 counties in Middle Tennessee. So. Do you get a vote in which projects get the money uh, or for any of these projects? So that's a great question. Um, <laughs> Who would you vote for? So um, <laughs> we, we, have, um, we, have been, we have been asked, me and my team, I have a, um, a development director and a project managed director, we, we have been asked to put together a list of projects that we consider um, worthy of um, spending this money on. And I think, I think Paul mentioned this, is that this is generational money. And we don't want to do 100 paving jobs. We want to do something that you know, you're swinging for the fences on, some things that we normally don't get to do. So um, as, as um, uh, Representative Woodson mentioned, you know, the, the rural interstates desperately need attention. And we've, we've turned in some of those, and there's some other projects in the area. But as far as the P3 piece, um, what is that? That the uh, the public private partnership piece, the um, the 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 choice lanes. Um, there are some analysis being done to look at that. And as Paul mentioned, I, I think the the pain. If you look on our, our roadways, it's intuitive of where those places are. You know, Murfreesboro to Nashville, which is probably our largest pain point in Middle Tennessee. Um, you know, the inner loop has capacity issues. If you go to Knoxville, 40 and where 40 and 75 come together in West Knoxville is a very painful area. Right. And, um, you know, those, and I'm not saying those are them, I'm just saying those are yeah. examples. Good. Good. And well, that gives us a hint anyway. That's what we were looking for. The, yeah. Uh, yeah, and I think that, uh, you know, what, what Jay's speaking to, the his team's being asked, uh, you know, where where is the need here in Middle Tennessee uh, and I, and he's going to submit a list that's going to be probably much larger than $750 million. Uh, $750 million or $3 billion is a lot of money, but in the transportation world, it just doesn't go that far. But uh, the, the commissioner has uh, agreed to come back to the General Assembly uh, by December of this year with a, with a proposal. Okay. Let's talk about some of the projects here in Williamson County. Uh, we've got three or four that are un well underway, the Franklin Road uh, project here in Franklin and also up in uh, Brentwood. The um, Murfreesboro Road between here and Triune is, uh, I hadn't been out there lately, but it's probably uh, well along. And then the interchange at Spring Hill. Um, 
going to make a major difference down there. Any updates on the um, completion dates on those projects? So I, I can answer those. So Good. I'll start with um, Franklin Road. It's done, and we're very glad it's done. If you, the Brentwood people in the crowd, it's you mean the northern people. I mean we we've been, we've endured that one for a while, and we're excited it's done. Um, east of here, 96 towards Triune is on schedule, moving great. Um, it's got a June of 24 completion date, and um, Vulcan is our contractor out there. It's a large grade job. They're doing a great job. South on the interstate, we have the Buckner Road Interchange, um, which is going to be changed to June Lake Boulevard, I think, as uh, Spring Hill people may know. Yep. Um, it, it's moving very well. Um, th and this is a good example of um, when we, we let this project, and, and Bell is our contractor out there, they bought the right away. They got the environmental permits. They did the whole kit and caboodle that they don't normally do. And they assumed some certain days for permits and buying property, and it took longer than they thought. And so they got hung up. And they and that's a good example. I know Kent um, and the road builders community want to talk about sharing risk. And that was, I know that was a tough one for Bell. Um, but that project is doing very well. You can see it coming out of the ground. Um, they ran into some dirt issues where the, the soil is, um, it, it gets wet and it's hard to work and it slowed their grading down. But the structure piece, the concrete piece is all on schedule and doing very well. That project was originally supposed to be done at the end of this year. I think it's about four months behind schedule now. So, but they're doing a great job and we're, we're happy with the work. Awesome. So Bell's a great company. Give them plenty of time to compact that dirt around the bridge approaches so that you don't launch as you hit the bridge uh, like we do at some of these others. Uh, yes, sir. <laughs> yeah. just, just a re personal no. request if, there. If there's any other questions I, about road projects, I'd be glad to answer those right now. Just don't go away. The uh, uh, TDOT does a three-year plan every is it updated every year or? Okay. And uh, several years ago, I think maybe uh, 2018, we had John Schroer here who was TDOT commissioner at the time. And I was happy to see, Jack and I were ha was happy to see that on that three-year plan, I think it was, that the southeast quadrant of Mac Hatcher was going to be widened, uh, going from Murfreesboro Road on around to Columbia. And... I got a copy of the three-year plan yesterday, and it wasn't on there anymore, and it hadn't been widened yet. What happened? Uh, <laughs> that's, a, that's a great point. Is um, Thank you for the question. It is in the IMPROVE Act, which means by law we will build that road. We, we, we're committed to do it. If I remember correctly, the plans for that one were done several years ago um, by Saint Associates, and it, it, this project has been around for a while. Um, and I, I think the the greater question is, hey, there's variability in our three-year plan. Obviously. What, what, what's going on? And that's something our chief engineer, um, Will Reed, has been really working on is that, that we want our three-year plan to be steady because stability is a blessing to the road builder community because they can plan, you know, they know how many tons of hot mix are going to be in their area for the next three years. Um, but it's a blessing to my staff that is developing the projects. They know exactly what they need to work on and when it'll be done. So um, I can't speak to why, I really can't speak to why it was removed to the plan. Um, I would say it's competing needs. I mean, we as... Um, and, and so as um, Representative Whitson mentioned, we have around $30 billion in needs statewide and capacity issues. Um, we have a $1.2 billion budget. Um, Region 3 gets the lion's share of that. We get about a third of it. Um, half of that is for state of good repair. So paving, bridges, keeping our assets in good shape, which leaves us with around $150 million a year to do capacity projects with. Um, you know, that usually one large project is close to $100 million now. Yep. And so it, we, we're, we're excited about the, these new dollars. I can say it's going to help us. Paul, repeat what you just said, if you will. Um, yes. So, you know, if you think about the, the impact of inflation starting really around 2015, we've just seen really skyrocketing inflation. 
in the construction industry. Most of us that have had any type of construction activity done, whether it's uh, you know city, county, state, or federal construction, is very expensive, and even the private sector development. So uh, the the inflationary trends. I know, and if you're a if you're an asphalt contractor, and uh, we build one of these great big giant jobs, and asphalt's the last thing you put down, how does an asphalt contractor quote? asphalt being placed three years from now. It's very, very difficult, a lot of risk. And so they, the contractors will put that risk into the contract. So we're, we're all trying to navigate that and that has a direct impact on when we fund a program uh, that says, here's the projects we plan on doing for the next three years. And then all of a sudden you see a, you know, a 22% in concrete prices, a 26% increase in asphalt prices can't find labor, <laughs> can't find a dump truck. Um, you know, all of those things are driving project cost and it's, uh, it's having a pretty big impact on how the industry, not just TDOT, but the industry does business and how our General Assembly has to figure out how to uh, put a budget together. Kent, Kent has a project that, that's uh, near and dear to his heart. Um, the uh, been a lot of energy, a lot of money, a lot of discussion about widening Columbia Avenue from Downs Boulevard out to Nicatcher, making it five lanes. Uh, as a member of the Chamber of Commerce, I've been opposing that from day one uh, because it's going to be very tough on the businesses up and down Columbia Avenue. What would be another option there that you think would make sense? Building the southwest section of Nicatcher um, would alleviate certainly traffic problems on Columbia, just as the northwest section has alleviated traffic through downtown Franklin for people trying to get to the interstate or cool, the Cool Springs area. You know, if you look at just the kids who are driving to school down to down to uh, Independence High School, you have to go down Columbia Road. The businesses that are on the west side of town that, that are headed to uh, other parts of the town, I think that you would see a decrease in traffic, certainly on Columbia Avenue, um, because of that. And so, uh, again, I'm, you know, I have self-interest, uh, in, and just like I had a self-interest in the northwest section, right, the southeast section, the building to, to move in and around Franklin, um, it, it just makes sense that that project be moved up in a priority list with, as the city looks at what projects are important. Paul, have, um, have you, as your staff, or your former staff, uh, compared cost on finishing Mac Hatcher versus the Columbia Avenue project? So I, uh, being retired, I, I think I can speak a, a little bit candidly here. So um, back in the day when I first started in the department, it was very commonplace for um, uh, General Assembly members and, and mayors and such to lean heavily on TDOT to take the beating for those types of decisions. Uh, but to be honest, that, that, that decision really needs to have uh, local input, local leadership. You know, the, the department, uh, you know, city, uh, state highways are also city streets and communities. And we, we really need to have community buy-in what we're doing for TDOT to come in and say, Franklin, this is what we're gonna do that just doesn't fly well. And frankly, the governor, the commissioner, and the department doesn't need to take that type of beating. There has to be some grassroots efforts to, to look at the situation and say, what is the best solution? I, I've worked with communities all across the state to where you know the city say, well, I want to bypass here. And the county says, well, I want it here. And I had one community one time, the they were arguing over a southern bypass versus a northern bypass, and they finally came to me and the commissioner and said, well, we can't agree, so we just want TDOT to build both of them. <laughs> and, you know, and it was a, you know, probably at the time, it was probably half a billion dollars or something like that, and today that city doesn't have anything. Yeah. They, they couldn't come to an agreement, whereas on the other hand, you go down to little old Winchester, Tennessee, um, they had that same argument, and we said, look, you guys need to come to us and say, what, what, what do y'all want? And they finally said, we don't care 
do the analysis and tell us what's best. And today, Winchester has a bypass. Uh, it's, uh, it's not a great big grandiose one, but it's the right fit and it solved the problem that they had. Yeah. And so that's where I think the department can come in is working with communities to look at what are the needs that a community has and what are the best tools to solve it. And when that type of grassroots support comes in from a community, that's where things start to get in. That's where the department can do the analysis. I'll give Williamson County and the cities of, you know, Franklin, Fairview, Spring Hill, all the Brentwood, all these communities, they like to see leveraged dollars. They work with, you know, Senator Blackburn and, and coming in and, and trying to find federal grant dollars, bringing city dollars to, to the table. And uh, many of the projects, the McEwen Interchange, Franklin Road, Mac Hatcher, Buckner Road, there's all these different projects that communities have said, we will bring money to the table. And when we go to the General Assembly and say, hey, we've been able to leverage federal, state, local, and sometimes private dollars, nobody argues that. Since you're retired, pretend it's Winchester again, and the local people say, pick the best route here. Uh, to solve the the congestion there on Columbia, what would you say? Uh, well, I mean, I think if you look at just Franklin, I mean, I'm I'm just making observations here. Look on the north side of Franklin, the 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 widening project uh, in front of the Franklin High School right now. That's a city project. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, T. Dot did the work to build the the Northwest Bypass. Uh, it's really change traffic patterns through there. The city came in and said, we want a, a, a streetscape project that works for that location. Will that same model work on the south side? I don't know. Uh, but, you know, my observation is that it, it works somewhere else. Uh, it could work somewhere, you know, somewhere else out there. But again, the community needs to own it. Uh, that project on the north side of town uh, they talked to the department about it, but they didn't ask TDOT to pay for it. There might have been some horse trading on some other projects around, but but it 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 is the example of what I'm talking about. The city of Franklin said, here is what we believe our community needs. They had some meetings with the community. And look, I'm sure a lot of the people that live up and down that road were apprehensive about it, but... Uh, but I believe that uh, I drove it earlier this week, and uh, it's a nice ride through there. By the way, let me be clear. I'm not saying we shouldn't widen Columbia. I'm simply saying that when you look at the ability to move people and goods, one way to be able to do that, to alleviate that congestion, would be to, to do the southwest section and to move it up on the priority list for the city. Um, and, and I just think that makes sense. Uh, again, as that part of town has continued to grow, you got more neighborhoods coming on the west side. And so we've got to be able to move traffic and be able to move folks. We're moving them to the, to the north side of town. We got to be able to move folks to the south side of town. Jay, have you got anything to add to that? I, 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 will, no, I will note that one of the things the community has to also think about is access management. If, if, if you build another facility and allow driveways and business fronts on that facility, uh, then 30 years from now, somebody's going to want a bypass of the bypass. Yeah. So access management is going to be a, a, a key here as well. Right. Can we talk about potholes now? Um. <laughs> uh, just, just seems like there's more potholes than there used to be. Now, our one-on-one -on -one conversation before we went on the air, Apparently, statistically, that's not correct, but it sure seems like it, Paul. So, so let me kind of just kind of give just a, a quick overview. So, you know, a lot of people, when they look at uh, a piece of road, they say, well, you know, that, that black asphalt is just black asphalt. You know, 98% of our pavements in Tennessee, the surface of it is asphalt. Uh, we, we do have some concrete pavements across the state. Uh, uh, everybody remembers I-440. Uh, it, it was concrete. It, it's, it's not anymore. But we do have concrete pavements in a lot of places. 
but uh, the pavement that you see today is not it's not my daddy's uh, pavement anymore. There's a, a lot of technology, a lot of research. Jay here is uh, an asphalt expert and uh, spent a lot of, of his career working in that area. And so one of the things that we do, we do at Asphalt Has a Life, we don't pave a road just because it's so many years old. Uh, we have technology, we have these this equipment with lasers and all this kind of stuff that measure all the pavement distresses. And we use that data to generate candidate projects. And then we use eyeballs and brains to go out and look at road the, these candidate projects to, to, to say when is the time to, to do a resurfacing project that just maintains the pavement. Think about it, a pavement's like a foot thick uh, for, for most of our state highway pavements. If we can maintain that top inch and a quarter, inch and a half of that pavement, we can create what's called a perpetual pavement. It'll last essentially forever. Um, but if you, if you let it go too long and it starts getting deeper, it exponentially increases the cost of, of resurfacing and, and, and rebuilding the pavement. But a lot of the technology we use is, is, is new. Uh, again, inflation is hitting. If you think about, we've got about a 15,000 mile state highway system. Um, if inflation ticks up another percent and we average resurfacing our roads every 12 years, I've had a pretty big impact to my annual budget or Jay's annual budget now. And so one of the things that we're trying to do is try new technology. So uh, one of the things that we started about nine years ago was an open graded friction course. We call it OGFC. Uh, but if y'all have driven down the interstate and you notice that when it's raining, you don't get the spray anymore, that is a new technology that, that we put out there, a 35% reduction in wet weather crashes with that product. What we found though, and particularly it was made apparent to us two years ago, that at the end of its life, it really, its condition drops off much faster. Uh, two years ago, we had some really, really bad uh, flash freezes here in the Middle Tennessee area. And so in Middle Tennessee, OGFC pavements for the most part, at the end of their life, we had more failures on. We did not have as bad of, of uh, winter in other parts of the state. East Tennessee, where we typically have bad winters, for the last four years, we've not had any really bad weather up there. Now look, it snowed up there, but it always snows up there. So one of the things that we're having to do is go in and modify some of these new pilot projects that we did. Yep. But again, a 35% reduction in wet weather crashes is huge. Yep. And so we want to make sure that, that we're continuing to use that type of technology. But if you look at our data and compare, compare us to all the states across the country, we're still a top performer in pavement condition across the country. Okay. Okay. Any anything to add to that? So I'm I'm like Paul. I'm a big fan of our open graded mixes. They um just to give you all an idea of um if you've ever made or eaten a Rice Krispie treat that is OGFC. I like food analogies, and you have that same size Rice Krispie aggregate with a um, real thick binder that puts that pavement and allows water to drip through it. And so um, safety is one of our top values, and we, we want to see um, our wet weather crashes reduced. And so that, that's why we've had a big push by putting this on interstates. Um, it's, it's, we, we really don't know how many lives it saved, but we're certain that it has. But as Paul said, um, the, the tensile strength in that pavement really degrades quickly at the end of its life. And so that's what last, not this past winter, the winter before, it was a little bit of Armageddon out there. Um, we had a lot of pothole problems, and this was one of the main culprits for it. And I really want to credit Paul to... We, it was mainly just in the middle Tennessee yeah. area. Yeah, giving the mic. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it was mainly just in the middle Tennessee area. So while, I mean, I know the, the Hillsborough Road wasn't no GFC, but it was at the end of its life. We got a lot of complaints about Hillsborough Road. And... Look, in February, our contractors can't get out and put hot mix down. I mean, it, 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 it won't stay, and sometimes we have to, and sadly, the General Assembly comes in January, February, and, you know, March and all, 
and and so we 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 heard a, a little bit, but uh, but we've tried to educate uh, people and and understand. We try to get out there and make sure that that it's not bad, but we are trying to be predictive and make sure that we get roads fixed. But sometimes the weather's just bad. Re remember, if we go out and pave a road just before it falls apart, we get the phone calls. There goes T dot wasting money paving a road. Don't need it. <laughs> Dave, would this, uh, Jack and I was wondering, would this stop your weekly text about a pothole? <laughs> this their answer? Probably, probably not. You know, I, I was noticing that the governor, you didn't want to talk about this, but the special session, he's put a portal out there where you can go in and vote how you feel about gun control. Is there, is, can't we have one of those to vote on which road we think needs to be paved next? And... <laughs> Jack, <laughs> we we have we we do have a um, an eight hundred number, and, um, <laughs> and it is eight 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 T dot fix, and we we will take um, and seriously that's what it is, and we we would take any any pothole requests um, if there's vegetation issues, if there's striping sign issues, we we would love to hear and get feedback from those, and if you want to tell us which road to pave, we can. I'll, I'm glad to take that too. I'll write that down. Uh, give it to me again after we after we close. Um, we always like to open the to open it up to the floor for questions. Uh, do we have any out here that uh, might be additional to what I've asked, Tom? Uh, this this gentleman needs to be thanked. August eighth, two thousand nine. You remember where you were on that morning? I think my uh, photos app will probably have a picture of it. It, it reminds me every day of something I. Did. Uh, it's the day the Lawrenceburg gas tanker hit the uh, bridge on Batonsville Road at 965. I remember the uh, uh, commissioner wasn't there, but you were there. Uh, and you looked into Rogers Anderson's face and said, I got to shut it down. And he said, for how long? Because Williamson County Fair was opening that day. Uh, across the interstate and said, oh, no more than a year. And Rogers Anderson goes white. And uh, uh, But you were true to your word. It was almost a, a year, and this was a brand new bridge now that truck had hit. Uh, but we had another brand new bridge in less than a year, and I thank you. Well, I appreciate it. You know, certainly I think it was... Uh, We've been reminded of that issue with the I-95 collapse up in Pennsylvania. It was a, a tanker truck. Those type of things happen from time to time. And, you know, um, as chief engineer, uh, a lot of 2 a.m. phone calls that, you know, um, and, uh, you know, that, that wasn't the only type of phone call like that I've received in 18 or 19 years as chief engineer. But uh, certainly um, I was proud of our team. Uh, uh, between the TDOT staff, giving them the ability and to, to make decisions. We had great contractors on the job that stood up, and, and it, you know, and it, there was no arguments about, well, you're going to have to pay me all kinds of money. It was like, what do you need, TDOT? We're here to help. That's one of the great things about our industry between our TDOT staff, the, the consultants that we use on projects, and the contractors out there, support from our legislators. This entire industry uh, has allowed us to, to come in and make those types of repairs that, uh, that keep the economy flowing in Tennessee. Got another question here. Introduce yourself. Uh, Sean Kehoe, Williamson County resident. Um, two things. First, you made a statement about there not being an appetite for increased fuel charges in the legislation. Um, first point is, with everything going to EV, what is the, the legislature's plan to keep up with these things? I understand you're also all road guys, and so these roads are your nail. Uh, or what, what, are we, what are we doing about the... Na Nashville and Middle Tennessee has a rush hour problem and not, in my opinion, a road problem. Not one thing was mentioned about what are better ways to move larger volumes of people 
between here and downtown and, and so forth. W what is Williamson County's plan and what is the overall plan to expand rail services, which the federal government is targeting us for uh, connectors between Chicago and Florida? Yeah, I'll start and then I'll, I'll turn it over to our, our General Assembly member. So, so keep in mind, there are lots of different types of transportation modes out there. So a lot of the talk about some of the, the connectivity between Chicago, Tennessee, and, and you know, uh, Atlanta and, and other places, that's not commuter rail. That is, those are, are transportation services. We work closely with the Metropolitan Planning Organization and and in provide funding, and, and actually several pieces of legislation passed over the years have generated funding. Certainly, we are a transportation agency, and we own the state highway system. But operating on the state highway system are pedestrian facilities, bike facilities, and transit programs. And TDOT provides funding for all of those different modes. And the discussion that the, the, the governor and the commissioner had this past legislative session also spoke to transit benefits from this legislation. I, I'll let Sam and, and Jack talk a little bit about what the legislation did to support those things and to talk about the electric vehicle component. First, about the electric vehicle, that's a, that is a, an issue, and it's going to be a growing issue. When we first passed the IMPROVE Act, there was 1,500 electric vehicles in the state of Tennessee. Now we have over 15,000, and that number will grow. Of course, we know the Highway Trust Fund is broke, and they're using borrowed money to pay for that because we have more vehicles traveling more miles, but the efficiency of the vehicles has gotten so much better. So what we did uh, in the uh, Modernization Act, we increased the fees for electric vehicles, and it'll go up over a three-year period to a max of $275, and also a $100 fee for hi hybrid vehicles to ensure that they pay their fair share of the cost of maintaining our roads. The real challenge on electric vehicles, though, is when you set a fee, how do you make sure it's fair to the person who drives 5,000 miles a year in their electric vehicle and the one that drives 50,000 miles? So technology is going to have to answer that question for us as we go forward as the number of electric vehicles increase. The uh, transit, Jack, you want to speak to that? Yeah, thank you. Well, I, I I would say that the, the discussion about the choice lanes that, that we talked about, that is specifically going to be in the more congested areas. I think, in all likelihood, I think we'll see when the studies come back that if you have four lanes going each way and you add, you add a, a lane uh, each direction, that's a 25% increase in capacity on that, on that particular um, uh, uh, facility. The other thing is, is that <clears throat> one of the problems with mass transit or public transportation right now if you have a commuter bus that goes from Franklin to Nashville, you know, every day taking people to and from work, they're going out and sitting in the same traffic we're all sitting in, that bus is. And so one provision of this uh, choice lanes legislation that we passed is that, that those types of, of commuter uh, opportunities will be able to use the choice lane. So if, if you don't want to drive and you're willing to take a bus, you know, to and from, uh, you know, Nashville every day, you get on that bus knowing that it'll be in that choice lane. It won't be sitting in traffic. Hate to cut off the discussion now. Uh, we're out of time, uh, but you're welcome to st stick around. I think these gentlemen can uh, talk one-on-one uh, -on -one here for a few more minutes, and uh, we'd love to uh, see y'all mix and mingle. But we're out of time. Uh, it's been an excellent uh, group here. Really appreciate y'all taking your time out of their schedule to come. Oh, you've got a little more time in your schedule now, but we really appreciate you coming back and and uh, giving us some insights there. Kent, appreciate your insight. Jack and Sam, always like hearing the Williamson County side of these things and appreciate you all being here. Uh, a lot of people uh, work to make this show happen. Creed Henderson and the WCTV crew, uh, they're here really early every time we do this. Appreciate all they do to make us look good. And Tom, we appreciate WAKM staff for uh, getting us on the air there. Uh, Mary Beth Shally and uh, Dr. Lampley here at Columbia State, uh, they organize a crew here to, to make sure the facility is ready. Uh, Dennis Wagner and AT&T uh, make a financial contribution to the, to the effort. 
and the Good Fruit Food Group, uh, which is our local restaurant, uh, McDonald's restaurant uh, group, uh, make sure we have coffee here, and uh, we appreciate y'all making that happen. Uh, and then the chamber staff, uh, uh, Kel McDowell's the quarterback on this effort, but uh, Matt and Jenna and Nancy Conway and, and, and many others uh, work to make it happen. Uh, and it wouldn't be, uh, Kel's giving me a high five back there. I, I miss Vanderbilt, okay. We, uh, uh, Vanderbilt also, uh, and uh, uh, we appreciate their help. Uh, the, and it wouldn't be the same without a live audience. And we appreciate y'all being here at Columbia State. Look forward to having you back next month, and we will adjourn there. Thank you. Thank you.